The king, are we ready? Good evening, class. Okay, Sam. Good evening, class. My name is Samuel Rose. I'll be your moderator for this evening's lectures. Welcome to the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research Incorporated. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organizations. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year of 1931. We were later incorporated in the state of California in the year of 1958. Since that time, grant schools have been established throughout the United States and various parts of the world. The Orlando branch was established in the year of 1977. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of our Heavenly Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which were contained in the original Hebrew text. The true and correct name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by the title of Lord. The true and correct title for the word or son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted with the title of God. The true and correct name of the Holy Spirit, whether manifested in or out of a physical body, is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are lords many and there are gods many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title. But unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title, meaning that Elohim is the title that our Heavenly Father Yahweh chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part, any good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any letter or character in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. In addition, neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1600 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and correct name of our Heavenly Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, He is inscrutable and incomprehensible to the natural senses of man. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this fiery colored cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you how that everything on this chart abides within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within 
the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and can only be understood with divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yeshua, the Messiah, whom the whole world erroneously calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should all ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and of this title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel up out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh later instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The tabernacle pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three principal compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. We also go about in this school to show proof how that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. We have 10 primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute, and they are as follows. One, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Two, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua, the Messiah, without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Three, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Four, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, philosophy, psychology, modern, practical, and occult science. Five, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known that Yahweh, from the beginning, ordained there is no other name given among men, whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Joshua the Messiah. Ten, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah, with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, our slogan, speak the truth. We will begin this class with a prayer to be given by the Dean of the State of Florida and the Dean of the Orlando Branch, 
Dr. Jacqueline Mixon. Our scripture will be Leviticus, the 16th chapter, to be read by Dr. Seth Williams. Good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. Let us all bow our hearts and minds for a word of prayer to our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, through his Son, Yahshua the Messiah. Father, we are gathered in our thoughts and minds to know and understand things about your purpose, pattern, and plan. And we are asking that you surround us with your protection and your knowledge and understanding and give us the strength to continue to do our research and study to learn more about your purpose, pattern, and plan. All these things we ask in the name of our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, through his Son, Yahshua, the Messiah. Let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good evening. I'll be reading Leviticus, the 16th chapter, which is found on page 148 in the front portion of the Holy Name Bible. I'll be reading from the Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testament critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts revised by the late A.B. Trainer of the Scripture Research Association, reprinted by Yahshua Promotions. Leviticus, the 16th chapter. And Yahweh spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before Yahweh and died. And Yahweh said unto Moses, speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place, excuse me, into the most holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bull, with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat. He shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle and the linen mitire shall be, shall he be attired. These are the holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel, two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before Yahweh at the door of the meeting tent of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for Yahweh, and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which Yahweh's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before Yahweh to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before Yahweh and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before Yahweh that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And he, and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock 
and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the, for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the meeting tent of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the meeting tent of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the most holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before Yahweh and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he hath made an ending of reconciling the most holy, the holy place and the meeting tent of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land of forgetfulness. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness and Aaron shall come into the meeting tent of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments, which he put on when he went into the most holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar. And he that let go the goat for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water and afterward come into the camp. And the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought and to make an atonement in the most holy place shall one carry forth without the camp and they shall burn in the fire their skins and their flesh and their dung. And he that burneth them shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water. And afterward, he shall come into the camp. And this shall be a statute forever unto you that in the seventh month, on the 10th day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourn among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before Yahweh. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. And the priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead shall make the atonement and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments. And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make an atonement for the meeting tent of the congregation and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as Moses, excuse me, and he did as Yahweh commanded Moses. I read Leviticus, the 16th chapter. Let us all say hallelujah. Our first speaker will be Dr. Dennis Allen. Good evening, class. Good evening. As always, it's a it's a pleasure and privilege and an honor to have anything to say concerning this divine vision and revelation. Um, and obviously tonight, uh, we're going to deal with the, um, the day of atonement, uh, as, as read in the uh, 16th chapter of Leviticus. 
Um, I want to start out by let's just uh, define what this is and just just go through uh, some foundation, if you will, before we get into the meat of the subject. Um, now, this day is what the, the, the modern day Jew calls Yom Kippur. And Yom uh, simply means day and Kippur means atone. So uh, day of atonement. Uh, in Judaism, um, Yom Kippur, or what we commonly call it as the Day of Atonement, is the holiest day of the year in, Ju in, in Judaism, um, their most sacred day. Now, according to what we read here in the scriptures, and the, the Day of Atonement is in the seventh month, which is uh, Tishri, and there's a, a, a secondary name uh, for that month also, it's called um, uh, eth ethnym, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And you, you can look this up in, uh, this is in your textbook. And now with the Jews and, and, and the founder talks about, and we're gonna, it's a lot of stuff we wanna try to get into tonight, but the founder talked about this a little bit in uh, one of his transcripts, he mentioned it. But this year, the year 2021, uh, Yom Kippur, was in September. It was actually uh, September 15th. And it began on the, uh, the evening of September 15th and lasted for a 24 hour period until the following evening on the 16th. Um, and, and the reason why that is, is the Jews um, are using what they still call a sacred calendar, which is a lunar or some will call it a lunar solar calendar which gives you a year that is 354 days long, as opposed to uh, the calendar that we're now on, uh, the Gregorian calendar. And it's basically a solar calendar. And the year is 365 days long, uh, based on how long it takes the earth to make a one complete rotation around the sun. Now the lunar calendar is, is different in the fact that you get a new moon every 29.5 days. And when you take that 29.5 and you multiply it by 12, that gives you a 354 day year. Now, and, and you'll, you'll see this in the, in the textbook, but um, simply saying this, simply saying this, that if the calendars uh, are off by that much, uh, you're looking at a, a, a period of about 11 days and what would, it, what would end up happening and, and has happened over the course of time is that um, the year would be, uh, or the feast days, if you will, if they operated by one calendar and not recognizing the other, that your feast days will slowly slide out of season and everything will be off. And, and the Jews recognized this years ago. And that's why you, when you look in your textbook and you look down at uh, on the, the page where the, uh, in volume one, page 103, where there's a calendar there and you'll notice at the bottom of the page, there's a 13th month. And um, that month is called the Dar and it's called the intercalar intercalary month and it's inserted uh into the calendar to realign the calendar if you will or the dates so that uh the feast days if you will uh are not off off kilter and for us down here in in, in the modern times it's it's not an issue uh for israel back in the days of of, of moses and and the prophets and and the apostles um, or mainly the uh, Moses and the prophets, when feast days had to be held, um, they had to be held on time. And they had to be held, you, you couldn't tell the lambs uh, uh, to give birth in the winter. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. You couldn't tell the lambs to give birth in the winter uh, or to give birth when it wasn't time, or you couldn't have the crops growing out of season 
So again, it was necessary for the, the, the calendar to align with the time of the year that things were actually going on and taking place. So that, just a brief explanation on uh, uh, the Day of Atonement uh, not being falling on October 10th by the Jewish sacred calendar, um, like, you know, like it was necessarily said in the scripture. Other thing is this, and, um, and it, it, this, is, is, this is detailed in the textbook as well, uh, when the founder uh, talks about the, the peril of the Jew, and we'll, it, we'll get into that as well, the, the peril of the so-called Jew, because we know and understand down here now in class that in, in, in the purpose of Yahweh, that, that Yahshua was sent in to fulfill um, the things written of him in the law and the prophecy. Uh, he was also the high priest of high priests. So his mission was to come in and perform uh, the things that were performed in the tabernacle and in the temple, and that would include atonement. So you're going to see witnesses of that in the scripture uh, through people and, and, and processes. You're going to see witnesses of that with Yahshua the Messiah as he manifested himself in the earth plane. Now, when you look up the word atonement, uh, atonement means reparation uh, for an offense or an injury, um, satisfaction, uh, reconciliation of Yahweh and mankind through the sacrificial death of, of Yahshua. And this is the, the reality, if you will, of the priest making those trips into the tabernacle uh, three times a year while the tabernacle and the temple were yet in, 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 in function. Um, the, the reality of all of that, and I'm way at the end of where I want to be, but the reality of all of that is the salvation of a soul and that the Holy Spirit atoning for one, uh, atoning for one soul. And Yahshua has already done that. And so we're going through the exercise, if you will, of how these things were manifested back in the scripture and how Yahweh used the priesthood, a group of people, and uh, the individuals of Israel supporting that priesthood so they are they would be able to function and perform these functions on behalf of the people. Uh, when you look up reparations, it talks about the, the act of making amends. And so basically, again, the high priest uh, making those trips into the tabernacle those three times on that day, he's making amends for all the error of Israel, um, you know, for that past year. And and those sacrifices offered up by him, the high priest, and in the manner that they were offered, um, they're the only reconciliation uh, for Israel at that time. And the last word, uh, reconciliation, it means to settle and resolve. So when that Shekinah appeared in the, in the high priest's heart and mind, um, that's the reconciliation, if you will, of him for himself. Uh, talking about the priests that perform the service. Uh, that's the reconciliation for the children of Israel uh, because he's also going in there on their behalf as well. And that's the reconciliation for the cleansing of the sanctuary. So now, and, and even in the, the garments of the priests, and, and, and this isn't anything new that we're talking about, um, the names of the children of Israel are, are etched or carved into the stones on his breastplate. That they are also carved into the names of the uh, tribes of Israel are carved into the stones on his shoulders. So he's he's got he's got uh, basically the children of Israel, if you will, on his heart, and on his mind or the governments on his shoulders as he's carrying them in there. And that one man, that's one man making intercession uh, for the children of Israel uh, uh, back there through the scriptures. Now, again, uh, with the, the modern day Jew, this is, uh, this is critical. And, and the father talks about this, or the founder talks about this in the textbook as well. Um, now, this is how they, they celebrate the Day of Atonement. Uh, the Day of Atonement is, is regarded as a Sabbath day in, in Judaism. Uh, now, the things that are prohibited by Jewish tradition on the Day of Atonement, there is no eating, uh, there is no drinking on the Day of Atonement, on, on, on Jewish, what they call Yom Kippur. Um, There's no bathing, so you, you can't wash in this 24-hour period. Um, 
there's no, and, and what they describe as anointing the body with oil or perfume. So there's no putting on any, any colognes, oils, perfume, deodorant um, in this 24 hour period. Um, no wearing of, we of leather shoes. Um, I, I still don't get that one, but, uh, and again, I, I guess they're talking about the fact that the, the priests were barefoot. Um, so they, 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 they proclaim that you can't wear a shoe that's made out of leather on Yom Kippur and um, no physical uh, relations between husband and wife during this 24 hour period. So now what they call this is the afflicting of a soul. And now, as far as the scriptures are concerned, uh, that's not what Yahweh was talking about. So now when he's talking about, or what he was asking Israel to do, when he, he told them there to afflict their souls, what he was really uh, prescribing or uh, describing for them to do is to humble themselves, uh, to be troubled in heart and mind. Uh, one of the other definitions was to injure. So again, uh, while the high priest is, is uh, atoning for them on that day, uh, and this day also being a Sabbath day, um, they are to be in their tents waiting for the low priest to sound the trumpets that Israel's sins had been atoned for for that year. And so you shouldn't be doing anything else, but then this, the, the modern day Jew, uh, again, because they, because there is no tabernacle set up, um, there is no temple set up, um, there, there is no uh, Levitical priesthood as described in the scriptures um, set up. Um, they've denied the blood of Yahshua the Messiah that he has atoned for them. So they, they, they wallow on in their, their ignorance, if you will, and have concocted their own righteousness. And, and like we read oftentimes in, 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 the, in the 10th chapter of Romans, how the apostle Paul talked about um, uh, being, they had a, the Jews back then had a zeal of Yahweh, but it wasn't according to knowledge. And, you know, basically paraphrased, they, they rejected the knowledge of Yahweh and have become their own uh, 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 righteousness, if you will. And, and that's what you see manifested down here now. So now to, to continue on with this, and as it was read in the scripture lesson, you had, excuse me, you had um, a bullock that was going to be offered. Uh, there's ram, uh, a ram that was going to be offered and two goats that were gonna be offered. Now, the ram is not gonna, it's not part of the sin offering. Um, the, the ram is for the con con uh, consecration of the priest. And, but the sin offerings would be the bullock, uh, which is offered from the priest on his behalf and his family, uh, the two goats. Uh, there's gonna be one that's going to be slain or sacrificed uh, for Israel. And then the second goat is what is called the scapegoat. And that goat is going to be set free uh, and, and taken into uh, the land of forgetfulness in the wilderness, if you will, by a fit man. Um, now, everything that we're going to talk about tonight, and, and we can't say this enough, that everything we're going to talk about tonight, as far as the, the sacrifices that are going to be offered, the priests that are going to be offering them, um, the, the, the fit man. Uh, all of these are, 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 are types and shadows or pointing to Yahshua the Messiah. Um, he's the ram. He's the bullock. He's the two goats. Um, he's the fit man. Um, and all of these things are zeroing in on him. He's the reality of all of these things we're talking about on this day. Now, the fit man he has to take the goat into the wilderness and a fit man is a man that's suitable. He's proper. He's acceptable. Um, that sounds like Yahshua. Uh, so again, this man, they just couldn't go grab anybody to do this. This man had to be designated as such to do this. Um, whatever could not be used uh, of the sacrifices that were offered on this day, the skin, the flesh, 
the dung had to be burned outside of the camp. And there's somebody that's gonna have to take care of that as well. So again, when this fit man, he goes and takes this gold into the wilderness and sets it free. Uh, when the, the skin and the, the flesh and the dung, the refuge of these sacrifices uh, that could not be offered in the, in the pattern, um, they just couldn't be uh, randomly discarded. They had to be taken to a place and burned. Um, there's got to be somebody to do that as well. So again, every, every, every minute of this, this, this event, if you will, every day of this thing, Yahweh's, he's got it charted out uh, in the scriptures where uh, this atonement can be made um, for, for the children of Israel. So now um, let's go back to uh, the scripture lesson um, and pick up uh, 16 and 1. Uh, we're going to read a couple verses of that, and then I want to drop down to about the 11th verse of that chapter. Leviticus 16 and 1. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before Yahweh and died. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh said unto Moses, speak unto Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all times into the most holy place. So now hold on, a, hold on a second, just a little bit of background on that. Uh, and you can go back, and I think you go back to, uh, or go forward, if you will, um, into Numbers, third chapter. We're not going to get that now, um, where it, it mentions uh, the, the death of those two sons, and that would be Nadab and Abihu. Now, Aaron, he had other sons. He had uh, Ithamar uh, and Eleazar, um, our sons. And they eventually would take over as the two low priests in the stead of Nadab and Abihu after they offered um, uh, a, a strange fire on the, on the altar of incense and died. Um, and, and again, you always got these things in the scriptures for a reason, that, that back there, there was a prescribed method of, of service in the pattern. And... Um, uh, men uh, that were chosen, consecrated, set aside, anointed, washed and anointed to perform these services in the pattern and um, in the tabernacle. And the seriousness of this is that, that these people, these men uh, that were Levites on a daily basis uh, were set aside to intercede on the behalf of the children of Israel to save them basically from the perils of that, that law that was spoken down from Mount Sinai, the law we commonly call the Mosaic law. And that Without this tabernacle in the wilderness, without the high priest functioning in the tabernacle in the wilderness, there's no salvation back there in a type. There's no atonement for sin back there because these men, and you read about this, in the, and we're not going to get this either, but you go back into the 29th chapter of Exodus, and I believe you read in there that there were sacrifices offered daily, morning lamb, evening lamb, in the pattern. Um, again, so the high priest and the two low priests they they uh worked every day um in this pattern for intercession for atonement if you will and and the founder talks about this as well he says not only the the, the 10th of october but how he described it that every day is the day of atonement um not just on this one day of the year, and then we don't have to worry about this again until next year. No, there's, there is intercession every day um, for the souls of men, for the sons that Yahweh has chosen to reveal himself to down to the end of this age. So, you know, this is not just a, a, a one-time thing. It's, it's all the time. It's every day. And even when we're not conscious and aware of it or forget about it, uh, atonement and intercession is being made. Uh, read Seth. Start at one again. Leviticus 16 and one. And Yahweh spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before Yahweh and died. And Yahweh said unto Moses, speak unto Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all times into the most holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat 
and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle and with the linen my tire shall he be attired. That's not the- right there. So now mm-hmm. in the first, basically the first 10 verses of the 16th chapter is, is like a description of what's getting ready to happen. So now when we get to the 11th verse of the 16th chapter, now we get into the actual performing of the sacrament. So now I want you to drop down to 16 and 11. 11th verse, and Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. Mm -hmm. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before Yahweh. And so now, the, the, now I'm, I'm going to be jumping in and out, Seth. So mm-hmm. Aaron's got to kill the, the order of service basically is Aaron's going to kill the bullock uh, for himself and his house. And next we're reading. Um, this isn't talked about a lot, but there's there's two sensors, not just one. And he's got a there's a sensor out there in the court with him and he's got to prepare this sensor. Um, the incense is in it beaten small. And he's going to take a coal off the altar to place it in the censer. And so when he goes in to the holy place and most holy place, it's like he's ascending like on a cloud. And again, you, and we know this, that Yahshua fulfills every step of this uh, uh, in his death, burial, resurrection. And in and, and the visions that, that the men saw him ascend into heaven and this tabernacle out there, uh, this physical structure is it's, it's a witness to the ministry of Yahshua the Messiah and what he would do in the flesh himself. And, 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 the, and, and here's the crazy part about this. And, and this ain't this ain't new either, that these men, as they're performing this. They're, they're not even conscious of the fact that this points to Yahshua the Messiah. They're performing this work because that's what Moses saw in the mountain, this vision. And that's what Moses comes down and instructs Aaron and his sons to do. Remember this. We, we talk about this all the time, but this part we don't talk about too much. Moses saw this in his vision and he saw how to build it. We talk about that all the time. But Moses also saw the function of the priest. And how these things were done. And he, this is, he, he's the one that's got to explain this to Aaron. Aaron didn't know. His sons didn't know. So then where are they getting the stuff? This, these things were revealed to Moses. And he comes down and, 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 and tells them what to do. And then they perform these things. Go ahead and read, Seth. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before Yahweh. And his hands full of sweet incense beaten small and bring it within the veil. Mm -hmm. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before Yahweh, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. Right. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Now watch this. So now. The, the, the way this is written, you always got it like in a mystery, is that you, you got him in, in the court roundabout, uh, killing the bullock, putting incense in the censer, taking a coal off the altar. And then, you know, a few sentences later, he's in the most holy place, sprinkling the blood. And this is his first trip and into the most holy place. And we're going to we're going to jump to a transcript um, uh, as we as we we're going to go through this and we're going to jump back to the transcript. But um, he's got that sensor on his arm. He's got blood in his hand and he's going to enter into the most holy place on his first principal trip, if you will, and sprinkle that blood toward the mercy seat seven times. Go ahead and read that. Fifteen first. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people. And bring his blood within the veil. Listen to what he just read. So now the high priest has come all the way back out. And he's back in the court again. So now he's killed the bullock in the court roundabout. And he's on the 
he's on the north side of the altar when he kills the bullock and when he kills the goat. The north side of the altar would be the side of the altar where the table of shoe bread is. That's the north side of the tabernacle. So the, 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 the sacrifices are slain there. And then he makes his figure eights into the holy place and most holy place. And so now he circles his way back out, all the way back out to the court roundabout where the two goats are. And again, he, he's going to pray the sins of the now for the children of Israel onto the goat that's going to be slain. And he's going to slay that goat and take the and take that blood in. Go ahead and read that. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock mm -hmm. and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And mm -hmm. so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Right. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the whole, in the most holy place. Now, hold on a second. So now, Remember the two low priests, they're they're not, and when it says in the tabernacle, it's talking about in the holy place and most holy place proper. Uh, the two low priests are in the court or in, in the court roundabout, and they're they're listening and waiting. Uh, they they got things to do, but they're standing there waiting. So with the high priest alone is performing this function. So now after he sprinkles that blood of the goat, uh an additional seven times that would be a total of 14 sprinkles the first time with the blood of the bullock the second time with the blood of the goat now he comes out to the holy place and he puts the blood of the bullock and the goat on the horns of the altar of incense so he anoint because you're, you're reading it. i don't know if we got to it yet so for i was you read over it where he talks about when he comes before the altar of uh, that's before Yahweh, find that verse for me. That's in uh, um, it's the 18th verse. 18th verse. Yeah, go ahead. You want me to just keep coming down, or because I was at 16, or okay, just jump ahead. to 18? Yeah, yeah, just, okay. just yeah. Come on down. Come on down. Okay, 16th verse, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And mm -hmm. there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the ho most holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he mm -hmm. shall go out unto the altar that is before Yahweh and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. Now, now when this is key. So he's not coming all the way back out into the court round about. This is not talking about the altar of sin sacrifice. This is talking about the altar of incense. That's the altar that's before Yahweh, because just beyond the veil, the second veil, what you got? You got the Ark of the Covenant. That's the throne of Yahweh. So the Ark, the altar of incense is the Ark, the altar that's before Yahweh. So when he comes out, he's going to take the blood of the bullock and of the goat, and he's going to put it on the horns of the altar of incense. Read on, Seth. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness, cleanness of the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat 
and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, now, putting them upon. The, mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Putting them upon the head of the goat, mm -hmm. and and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. Now watch this. Now, what's got to happen is now after the high priest makes that second trip, uh, with the blood of the goat, into the most holy place and sprinkles the seven times. He does not return to the court roundabout until the entire service is complete. So now the scapegoat was left in the court roundabout with the two low priests. They bring that goat to the door of the most, I'm sorry, of the holy place. And the priest prays the sins of Israel on that live goat at the door. And that goat is then taken out of the tabernacle, given to the fit man to take that goat into the land of forgiveness. Now, it, it's a couple places, and, and we're, we're going to tie this together. We're going to nail this down. Um, you can't bring you can't bring a beast into the holy place. Okay. Now, once the high priest takes that second trip into the most holy place and sprinkles that blood, that additional seven times, that would be a total of fourteen sprinkles at this point. He's going to change clothes, and he can't go. He can't go into the court roundabout dressed in those garments so there's no going back out into the court roundabout while he's in those garments of beauty and glory there's no him going back out into the court roundabout until the order of the service is complete and he's finished so now it, it, i don't know if we got a, a, a couple of the readers on i need um, somebody standing by with the textbook. Um, I need, um, we're going to need, um, and I need, uh, I need a transcript as well. Um, I need somebody to get, and I, I think I've already sent the notes on this, um, the transcript called uh, September 29th, 1974, uh, Day of Atonement. And this is in the Black Book of Transcripts. And I also, I'm also going to need, um, we're going to need, if someone has got the archetype, uh, I don't think I sent you this, but we need to get God, God the archetype, page 120 in God the archetype. And where I want you to start reading, it says, as the Le Levitical priest, want to put your finger on that. Uh, we're also going to need, um, volume two of the Elohim book, page four. Um, the prophet, the name of the assignment is called the prophetic birthday of Yahshua and, and the, I think in the mission of John the Baptist or something like that. And um, I'm also, I also, um, I'm going to need uh, the vol volume three of the Elohim book uh, in two different spots. I'm going to need volume three, page 25. I'm going to need volume three, page 42. Uh, and, and we're going to use those things to kind of concrete and, and solidify some of the things we've already talked about. So now the high priest, after he prays the sins upon the live goat, what he does is he returns to the altar of incense. He washes, he changes his clothes, and he puts on the, the glorified garments of the garments of blue, beauty and glory. And he makes his third trip into the most holy place with the blood of the bullock and the goat. And he sprinkles that blood seven times before the mercy seat. And at the 21st sprinkle of blood, there, there, there's the Shekinah uh, or the appearing of the Shekinah. And now he knows that the sins of Israel have been forgiven. 
And remember, the two low priests are at are at the door or outside of the door in the court roundabout, and they they are listening for the high priest and what they're listening for to hear him come out of there because he's got on the hem of his garments, on those garments of beauty and glory. He's got bells and pomegranates so they can hear him ringing and they can hear those, the seeds and those pomegranates shaking. And when he comes out of there, they, they know that their sins have been forgiven and then they can uh, blow the, the, the trumpet, letting Israel know and though, and, and I know, I remember many times that uh, uh, Dr. Mixon used to talk about this, that he, he would often lecture that when that high priest was in there making those trips, he said some of the people were actually concerned in, in their tents and others that were out there in the wilderness didn't care. Um, so again, but this is, this is what is going on when the priest is making those trips. Um, then the high priest, he returns to the altar. He removes those garments. He washes himself with water again. And he returns to the white linen and exits the tabernacle. Now, that's the order of service uh, uh, for the high priest on the Day of Atonement. Um, so now what I want is let's go to, let's go to the transcript first. And... Um, now, Seth, does somebody have the entire book of transcripts or do they just have the, the page with the notes on it that I sent them? Um, I have the entire book. Okay, then I want you to go to page three of that transcript. And there's a, there's a huge paragraph there that starts out with Dr. Kinley. It says, now listen, the boss showed me. You see what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and what he's getting ready to talk about is the Day of Atonement. And he says, go ahead and read some of that, Nikki. Um, it says, Dr. Kelly, now listen, the boss showed me, and I'm showing you, you can't argue with it. Everybody that's ever rose up against what we teach down at this school has been defeated for 43 years. You can't get by with it any more so than you can get by with an argument saying that the sun don't rise and the sun don't set. Now, stop right there, Nikki. Now, I want you to jump down. Oh, no, go ahead and read to where he mentions the Day of Atonement. Keep going. We give you that at jump. Now, I want to mention one or two things about the Day of Atonement, and that is this. Now, Dr. Harris already done told you about it, and you never heard it before in your life. And I doubt seriously whether you'll hear it anymore afterwards unless you hear it in the school because they know nothing about it. Now, and drop we... down, drop down, Nikki, to where he says, now the majority of them... Uh, not a majority of them that uh, you know anything about it at all. Read that part. Now, the majority of them that you know anything at all about the big shot preachers on TV and whatnot, they have plenty of money to sponsor such programs and all like that, but they don't have no knowledge of what it is all about. Now, let me get on into this and get on let, down. Let, 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 let me jump in here right here for a second, Nikki, because back in September, uh, when... Uh, the 15th and 16th, um, I sat here at, in, at the house and I watched um, preachers on TV, uh, uh, regular uh, non-Hebrew preachers, if you will, uh, deal with the Day of Atonement or, or attempt to. And then I, I watched a, it's this one Jewish uh, rabbi type guy um, deal with it as well. And it's nothing like um, how it's, it's taught and, and, and that's expected. So I'm, I'm not surprised about it. And none of you should be either. It's, it's nothing like it's taught the way it's taught in, in the class, in the school. Um, none of, none of the, the, the detail of the, of the trips, none of the detail of the function of the priest um, is mentioned. Um, none of uh, uh, um, uh, what it's really pointing to uh, is talked about. It's, 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 it's glossed over at best. 
So then reading here in the transcript, when uh, the founder makes these statements and these, this, this transcript is dated in what, 1974. And it, this just didn't start in 1974. It's always been this way that they don't know anything about this and they're not going to take the time uh, to go into these things the, the way that Yahweh has shown us how to go into them. Um, it's too time consuming. And for, for the congregation, it's boring. It's not important because they haven't been taught the seriousness of it and, or nor did they understand it. And, and the ones that are leading them, leading them don't understand this. And so now go ahead and pick up where you left off there. This is the second or the first sentence starting back on page four. Now, let me get on into this and get on down out of the way. Now, the high priest, this is on the 10th, ordinarily on the 10th day of October, which was on the 26th of September this year. Now, uh, now you see, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, remember, we, we, we started out talking about the Jewish sacred calendar and how this year in 2021, that the Day of Atonement was on the 15th slash 16th of September. So now way back here in 1974, he's referencing that, that October the 10th, ordinarily it's on the 10th of October, which is the 26th of September this year. So you could see the Jewish sacred calendar is still not aligned with what we know to be this day and how it's supposed to be uh, kept or when it was supposed to be kept. Uh, go ahead and read. Now the high priest took the blood of the beast in the a container. Now pay, try to pay strict attention. Now this is what I'm on. This is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Yahshua the Messiah now. That's what I'm trying to show you that this is a type. It's, a, it's in a shadow. It's in a reflection. Now he went to the right side of this veil, the high priest on the day of atonement. He had on his arm the censer that hung down and in his hand he had this container with this blood in it mm -hmm. and when he approached the veil i'd be just like i'm coming up here to it now he approached the veil with the blood in his right hand and with the censer hanging on his arm and then he went to the side of the veil and he pushed this veil to the side and then he entered so now he what the founder is explaining is that the high the, the, the high priest he goes to the, he's made a figure eight around the altar of incense. And then he's, he's gone over to the right side of the second veil. He's got the blood in his right hand. The censer is hanging on his right arm and he's going to part the veil with the left hand. And he's going in on the right side of the tabernacle, which would be on the north side of the tabernacle. Read, Nikki. He entered in at the right side. Then he took the censer and set it down right in front of the altar, right in front of the ark. Mm. And the go ahead. And that cloud formed out of that censer, that smoke. Are you with me thus far? Mm -hmm. Then he went around to this side. The staves on the ark he took around this way. Then he come on around throwing that blood. Listen now. Now, somebody want to argue something about it because they don't know, don't know nothing about it. You follow? Throwing that blood toward the, toward the mercy seat seven times. And that correlates with the circle of Willis in your, in your cranial, cranial cavity. So you, now do you want to argue? Now you have the veins that run hold up. Hold it, and hold it. Now, stop right there, Nikki. Now, uh, for those that can see, I want you to go to the PowerPoint and pull up slide number three that one so now what he's getting ready to explain here now if you look at the vertebral column on the illustration and you look how it goes up to the base of the skull and you look uh, uh um there's a couple things i want to point out here um you see the word vertebral, it's right under, uh, uh, how do you say this? Um, carotid. Carotid, carotid sinus. Um, so that word vertebral, he's, what in the illustration, that's pointing out a vertebral artery. 
there's one of those arteries on each side of the vertebral column uh, going up your spinal cord into the base of the brain. So now the, the founder is going to correlate, and, and Dr. Harris apparently did this in his lecture prior to the founder getting up. He's going to correlate these arteries with the function of the low and the high priest in the pattern. Now, Nikki, go back to the transcript. Now you have the veins that run up and the arteries that run up the sides of your, both sides of your head, one running one way and one running the other. Is that almost right, Dr. Harris? Mm -hmm. Dr. Harris, that's right. Dr. Kenley. And those veins carrying that blood, why then you have blue, purple, and scarlet right in the neck. And that neck formed that veil there. Now then when he went to this side and he would come on around just like that circle of Willis. And then he now hold on. Now, hold on now, before we get to that part. So now, those two arteries, they converge, they converge. Now, go to slide number two. So now, if you look at the circle of Willis on the right-hand side, those, verte or those vertebral arteries, they converge into what is called the basilar artery. It's easier to see on this slide than it is on slide number two than it is on slide number three. So now, basilar artery. The basilar, um, that means base entry. So now, that artery is right at the base of the skull, just past the vertebral column as it as those veins enter into the brain or into the head and Yahweh made them name this base artery so or, 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 or the basilar artery which means base entry so now we got the high priest parting that veil going into going into the most holy place now those two vertebral arteries on each side of the spinal column, they converge into the center of our heads, which would put the high priest, as he parted that veil, where is he going? He's going to the Ark, he's going to the, the, the ark of the covenant, which is sitting where? In the center of the most holy place. So see, the, the, the way Yahweh has laid this down, it's undeniable. He's put it in the book, he's put it in the book, and then he's manifested it in our physical bodies the way they operate. And and this and this atoning, this atoning now, because that blood is circling that is circling that circle of willis every day, all day just from a physical natural standpoint this is this is going on in us from a physical natural standpoint so somebody would say you know what i i just don't believe what's in that bible uh somebody wrote that and they it's 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 a and i've heard people say this i heard people say this recently that the bible is just a collection of fairy tales that the scriptures are just a collection of of somebody's random thoughts but then when yahweh does so does how is your the way your physical body operates is that a collection of random thoughts and if it didn't work the way that it did you'd be you'd be on your back in a box and 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 the father's put this in here this way to to prove who he is and what he is and what he said he was going to do so now go back to the transcript nikki I'll start back at the top of page five. It says, now then he went to the side and he come on around just like that circle of Willis. And then he picked up the sensor and he came back around. He picked up the sensor. Now, where is he going? He's coming on down. He comes to the left side now and he's going to push that veil back on the left side and he's going to come on out the left side. Mm -hmm. What's that for? Why is that? What's that for? When he went in the right side, that's got him towards the future or towards the end. When he come back through to the left side, that carries on back to Adam. Wait, wait. So now 
and, and we talk about this all the time now, but uh, imagine yourself sitting in class looking at, looking at the age of the dispensation chart. And on the right side of the cross, that's down here where we are after the death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we're so-called now in a spiritual age because Yahshua has fulfilled this old law. He's fulfilled this service that we're reading about tonight in, in, in the pattern. And so when the high priest goes in on the right side and he's sprinkling and he gets to that, uh, uh, that Ark of the Covenant and he's sprinkling that blood, that's what everybody all the way down here to tonight on, and when he goes in on the right side. And then as he makes that rotation around and completes that rotation and he stops back at the center of that altar where he started, he picks up that center sensor and he backs out of there on the left side. And the founder says, he said, now read that part again where he says, when he comes back through, read. When he come, when he come back through to the left side, that carries on back to Adam. Mm -hmm. Keep going. That meant atonement was made for everybody. Now listen, get it straight now, get it straight. When Yahshua the Messiah was offered up, that was the atonement for every creature, all mankind. There was not and never is going to be any more sacrifices offered up, period. Now you have to accept that now, one. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. I got to jump in here again. So now, and now, now we started out with the, and I was talking about the peril of the so-called Jew. Now, what Yahweh has done is he's fixed it where, and, 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 and guys, believe us or not, all these lectures that we've been going through, they all, they all are connected. It's just, a, it's just a series of lines going to different dots telling us a story. Now, you remember when back in March when we worked with the temple and how and, and worked with the, 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 the insurrection of, of the Capitol and how those individuals went in there and, and, desecrated, and desecrated that site. Then we, we, we go back in, in the book and, and showed how, or, or Yahweh showed how, that he sent, what was it, Shishak in there to uh, molest Solomon's temple. Now, it stood, and you can, you can verify this in the scriptures, it stood for another, it wasn't completely destroyed at that time. It stood for another almost four or 500 years uh, until uh, uh, Israel is taken into the Babylonian captivity. captivity. Then Nebuchadnezzar goes in there and basically tears it down. Now that's when it's completely destroyed. Now, the, the point I'm making is this, and then later on, after Israel comes out of the Babylonian captivity, Guys, I'm still on the Day of Atonement. When they come out of the Babylonian captivity and Zerubbabel's temple is built down to Yahshua, and then the Herodian temple is just an addition to Zerubbabel's temple or it, 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 a, a more glorified structure, if you will. But then... Yahweh sends, and now, and we talked about how Yah, when, the, when the Jews went to show Yahshua the temple, and he said, this is, in, 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 they said 30 and 6 years or whatever it was, it, what, I forget the number now, uh, the years it was in the building, 40 and 6. And he said, this is going to be torn down. And, and he said, how is this going to be torn down in three days when it took 46 years to build? He's not talking about that temple. He's the temple. He's the high priest now functioning in the pattern, making atonement, and they don't know it. They don't realize it, and they're rejecting him. So, and again, this is the peril of the Jews. So this is the way they, this is how they find themselves down here now. We don't want to find ourselves in that self-same peril by rejecting Yahshua the Messiah. So then what does Yahweh do again? He sends uh, Titus in, in AD 70 to destroy the Herodian temple. Now, this is after, this is well after the death, burial, and resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah, but he's, he's again nailing, nailing home the fact that, uh, her, or his lack of regard for a physical temple, because that's not it. Um, the temple was walking around amongst them. 
salvation and life, the, the high priest of high priests, who all of these things that we're talking about tonight are talking about is standing there with them. And he's caused men to come, come in and destroy all those physical temples that man has set up. So now this is the state and condition that he's left the Jew in. And then, and then scatters them all over the world, out of Jerusalem and everywhere else. Then Ishmael C comes in there and, and, and captures that land, captures the Temple Mount, puts their mosque there, where the, even if the Jews wanted to, they couldn't go in there and conduct this service in, on that mount the way Yahweh had prescribed. You're in trouble because you rejected Yahshua. Yahweh has laid this thing down and then, and, and, and then to add insult to injury, has revealed it to us, has revealed it to us that we might see it, understand it, and not to, not to uh, 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 keep up a bunch of book knowledge, um, but to save a soul that our own souls might be redeemed by knowing and understanding these things and that Yahshua the Messiah is the savior to the glory of Yahweh the Father. And he's laid these things down in the book. And see, what it does for you and me is that hopefully this exercise um, builds our faith and confidence in the operation of Yahweh. That if you can't see it, and well, I, I still don't understand how that worked in the scriptures, then he lays it down in our physical bodies and shows us that it, it operates the self same way and that he's putting the witnesses in us that we, we just don't have an excuse uh, down here. Now we don't, we, we just don't have one. You always put this thing down in a manner that now that, uh, that a fool can't air their end, that a child could understand it. Um, pick up there again, Nikki, in uh, the text, in the, uh, in the uh, transcript. transcript, yes. There was not and never is going to be any more sacrifices offered up, period. Now you have mm -hmm. to accept that one or else be lost because that's mm -hmm. a fact. That's a fact. There is no more sacrifices for sin. There is no more offering for sin. That was not Jesus Christ. That was Yahshua the Messiah. Now then he had to come on down out of there, come on down back into the holy place. This is the altar of incense when he come on back out of there. Mm -hmm. Then he comes back to this altar. That is the censer. It's setting right on the altar. That's the altar of incense. Then now as he walked around this, when that, when he went in there, I want you to see this. Now this blue, purple, and scarlet, and these garments for beauty and glory, not linen garments, not white garment, but they're blue, purple, and scarlet garments. Is that right? Or the garments for beauty and glory. And around his skirt, he wore there. Now listen to what I'm saying. There was bells around there, and as he walked, those bells would ring. Mm -hmm. Now, if he went into this and didn't carry out the service right, if he didn't carry that service out, he'd be dead. Now, that ought to tell you something. If these preachers don't carry this service out right, they're dead. Now, see, this is how we started out in the chapter tonight in the scripture lesson with the death of uh, Nadab and Abihu, not carrying out the service right. This is, this is vitally important for us. It's actually life or death that we down here now are, are, are claiming to be the ones with the truth. Uh, we're the ones down here now that are claiming to be the ones that are, 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 have been taught the vision straight from heaven. And it's incumbent upon us now that all that Yahweh has put within us uh, to tell the story right. Uh, to carry out the service right so we don't end up dead. Um, and, and again, the, 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 it's peril to one's own soul. And for anyone that hear us, if we don't do what's right, if we don't uh, uh, um, teach these things correctly and, and share these things the way they were given to us uh, according to the law and the prophecy. And, and, and that's, that's the weight that Yahweh has, has put on us down here now, like it or not, that's just the way that it is. Um, so now I'm, I'm done here with this transcript. Now we're going to jump back. Uh, I want you to get, let's grab, uh, let's grab God, the archetype first, uh, page 120. And I want you to pick it up 
at as the Levitical priest? This has got the archetype, page 120. It's the bottom paragraph on the left side. Okay. As the Levitical high priest on the day of atonement, when he offered the blood or sprinkled it seven times toward the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place before the presence of Yahweh, witness the flashing of the Shekinah within the cloud between the wings of the cherubim. So also did the apostles witness the same event. As the sun began to rise in the greater and more perfect tabernacle or temple, and also as the sun of righteousness arose in their hearts on the day of Pentecost, when the light of the world was poured out or flashed as, a, as the spiritual form of the Holy Spirit. Did y'all hear what he just said? He just tied in the day of Pentecost with the day of atonement. And with the high priest seeing the Shekinah. So then, and if you, it, it, when you go back, to it, pull up the elementary chart. Pull up the elementary chart. And zoom in on the Day of Atonement. I'm not the Day of Atonement, but zoom in on the Day of Pentecost. And I know on our, our chart, when they're sitting there in the upper room, you see a lightning bolt in the cloud over their head. You see what he's doing? He's lining up that Shekinah that the high priest saw on the Day of Atonement with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you go to stay on the elementary chart and when you go to the death, burial, and resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah, I believe in that tomb there you see a lightning bolt. He's risen. He's, he's lining up that Shekinah with the, the resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah and that angel sitting there. It's, it's, it's pretty. And all of these things just mesh and tie together. And he's, he's got, and he's, he's, he's again, th this, is, this is the Holy Spirit revealing these things. We, we would have never, ever figured them out we would have never tied these events together, seeing that they're one and the same, just the principle remaining the same, but the manifestation changing. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here for a minute and we're gonna go back to um, um, the, let's go back to the scriptures for a minute. I wanna go to, and then we're gonna come back to the Elohim book, but I wanna get, um, let's go back to the law. I want you to get Exodus 30 and 10 and Exodus 32 and 30. Exodus, Exodus 30 and 10. Mm -hmm. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year, once in a year, with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Mm -hmm. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. Now, where, he's, is, reading in the, where he's reading in the 30th chapter of Exodus, this is talking about the altar of incense. And so now... This is talking about what Aaron would do on the Day of Atonement by making atonement at this altar with the blood of those sacrifices. Finish that, Seth. Uh, and Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year, once in a year, with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in a year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. Mm -hmm. It is most holy unto Yahweh. Now, the, the reason why I'm having this read is just to concrete the fact that I said earlier that when the priest comes out with that blood and he makes atonement on the altar that's before Yahweh, it's talking about the altar of incense, not the altar of sin sacrifice, because they put blood on the horns of the altar of sin, uh, sin sacrifice every day, not just once a year. So then we're tying together the 16th chapter of Leviticus with the 30th chapter of Exodus. The concrete that what he anointed that day after he came out of the, out of the uh, most holy place after his second trip was the altar of incense. Now get Exodus 32 and 30. Exodus 32 and 30. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, 
ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto Yahweh. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. So now, now, now remember that this is pretty, guys. When this happens, is there a tabernacle yet? No. No. But Moses is, and where is Moses going? He's going in up into, mount. In he's mount. going up into the mount. He's going up in the cloud. Moses is entering in the most holy place. Listen, did Moses take anybody with him? No. You see how this is lining up? He has to go up alone and by himself, just like how the high priest has to go up into the most holy place of the pattern, alone and by himself to atone for Israel. So then Moses has to do the same thing in Exodus 32 because of the, the, the and, and he said it, that Aaron, now it caused the people to sin by leaving the plateau of the mount and going back down in the camp and, and then con and fashioning that calf. So now because of that error or that sin, Yahweh told Moses to get up and leave him be in the midst of his second trip in the mount and send him back down in the camp to see what that noise was. Moses don't understand what it is because he hadn't seen the transgression yet. So then he cast down the stones. It's, it's all, and y'all, this ain't new stuff. There's nowhere to put the stones. Not that first set. There's no tabernacle. There's no ark yet. So he has to break those. Typifying that Yahweh or, or Israel had broken Yahweh's heart or broken his covenant by, by, by constructing that calf and falling down and worshiping it. So now what Moses is instructed, and then Moses now, again, a type of Yahshua, the Messiah, and we, we talk about this all the time. He offers himself instead of the people. And Yahweh said, no, I'll, I'll punish who I, I want to punish. And, and, you know, and, and he said, Moses, I, I, I'll raise up a nation out of you. And, and, Yahweh, and, and, and Moses and mind you, now Moses isn't guilty of what Israel had done. But yet he's going to offer himself for them. That ain't nothing but Yahshua the Messiah. Not guilty of sin, but yet it's going to offer himself on the behalf of the people. So now you, you, you got these things lined up here in, in, in the law. And then you see physical manifestations of the actions of the people that are lining up with the Day of Atonement and the trips of the priest. Now, let's go to now. We're not going to read this, but I, 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 I urge everyone to read the book of Esther. It's, it's only about 10 chapters long, but read this book. There's a king in, in this book called As, As Sarah, so I'm, if I'm saying it right. And he has a queen. Her name is Vesti. And he calls a feast or, or whatever, and she won't come. And then he, sim he summers his chamberlains to go get her. She's I ain't going. She ain't coming. And she, she ends up not coming to the, to the feast. King's upset. And so, make a long story short, he makes a decision to, to get rid of her. And there's a man named Mordecai. And I think Esther would be his cousin, I think, because his uncle, Esther is the uh, daughter of Mordecai's uncle. So I think him and Esther are cousins, I think. Well, she comes to the, she ends up becoming the queen. And what happens is two of the king's chamberlains, they plot to kill him. Mordecai finds, finds out about it. And he tells Esther. Esther tells the king. The king has another uh, chamberlain. His name is Haman. Uh, he didn't care for Mordecai because Mordecai didn't bow to the king. So he conspires to have Mordecai killed and all of the Jews. 
Esther finds out about it. She goes and petitions the king. And the king remembers that Mordecai saved his life. And what ends up happening is Haman is killed. Mordecai and Israel are saved. It's a, it's a beautiful witness to atonement that, that atonement was made for Israel through Esther and, and Mordecai, and they were saved by this king. And you got witness after witness of this uh, through the prophecy. I want somebody to get for me, get me first Kings, the eighth chapter, uh, pick it up at uh, the 28th verse. First Kings eight and 28. Mm -hmm. Yet, yet have thou respect unto prayer, unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication. O Yahweh, my Elohim, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, my name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. So what we're talking about is the, the, the consecration, if you will, of Solomon's temple. Go ahead and read. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel when they shall pray toward this place and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and when thou hearest, forgive. Mm -hmm. If any man trespass against his neighbor and an oath be laid upon him to cause well, when, him... When, wait, wait, read that part again. When you hear this what? Prayer, forgive. And when thou hearest, forgive. That's atonement, guys. Be. If any man trespass against his neighbor and an oath be laid upon him to cause him to swear and the oath come before thine altar in this house, then hear thou in heaven and do and judge thy servant, condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head and justifying the righteous to give him according to his righteousness. Mm -hmm. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house, then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel. That's atonement, read. And bring them again unto the land which thou get, which thou gavest unto their fathers. Have you gotten through to the 38th verse? Not yet. 35th okay. verse. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk. And That's give atonement. Rain that's atonement. I mean, it's it's just it's just laid down through the prophecy like that over and over and over again, sinning and atoning for sin. And so you you, you see it in the in the physical day of atonement in the pattern, but you always got to lay down in in, in 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 these what we call stories in the Bible. It's there. Read. 36 verse, then hear mm -hmm. thou in heaven. And forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. Mm -hmm. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locusts, or if there be caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man, or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his own hands toward this house. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do mm. every. That's atonement. That's what it is. Listen, and, 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 he, and, and Yahweh is specific here when he talked about prayer and supplication. They're almost the same thing, but like, and, and here's an example, uh, and, and, and they're different. In, in this regard, um, you can pray for something, okay? Um, you can pray to be healed. You can pray uh, for knowledge and understanding. You can pray for, 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 for Yahweh to turn you around or, 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 or whatever. But then supplication 
is a pleading. It's like prayer at, a, at another level. It's a, it's a crying out. It's a pleading for forgiveness. And it's kind of like when, and, and you go through this in the book of Judges, when, when Yahweh was sent uh, a judge to, uh, to judge Israel. And then when that judge died, he would send a nation in there to afflict them. And he would let that nation afflict them and afflict them and afflict them until he got, he got satisfied. And they would cry out. For, for, for mercy and forgiveness that's supplication that's supplication they're they're begging to be delivered from that plague or from that nation that is plaguing them and so this is why he's talking about prayer and supplication here in kings eight now you, you'll read the same we're not going to read all of this but uh if you get and, and take take the time and go through this go if you get second chronicles the 29th chapter and read through that you're going you're gonna to see the same type of things going on with intercession, prayer, uh, 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 supplication, uh, 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 atonement uh, for Israel uh, through the book. And, and, and he's laid these things down here. So this day of atonement, and, and, and I think the point I'm trying to make here is this, that this day of, a day of atonement, as we see it practiced, is not just October the 10th. It's all the time. And, and, and Israel through the book found themselves and, and Yahweh, and I say found themselves, Yahweh put them in situations where they had to beg, they had to cry out, they had to pray unto him to be delivered. And, and we, we talk about this all the time. He always delivered them. Why is that even important now? Because because somebody will sit here and say, you know what? Dennis, I hear all this stuff you're saying, but what about me? That's all we've been talking about at night is you. Is, is, the, is the power of Yahweh being manifested back there that, that we might see and understand down there that that same power is available now. That same atoning is available now. Not, we're just not talking about Bible stories. The, the exercise is to concrete our faith in the operation of Yahweh. That he's done it over and over and over again, and he's still available to do that now. This ain't just about a, a, a priest going in a tent. It's about Yahshua's, Yahshua bringing forth salvation. Get Matthew 27 and 50. Uh, uh, grab Matthew uh, 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 28 uh, and 1. Matthew 27 and 50. Yahshua. When he cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom, from the mm -hmm. top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent and the graves were open. And many of the bodies of the sons which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection mm -hmm. and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, when the centurion why, they, why, is, why is that? Shekinah, he's atoned for. The, the, the salvation is here. It's him. And so all of this stuff we read at this point is it, it, fix, fixated and, and zeroing in on Yahshua and Messiah coming in and doing what he does, being Yahweh's salvation. That's what, his, that's what his name means, Yahshua. Yah, Yahweh is salvation, and he's, he's wrought that. He, he's manifested now, done with the types, done with, like the founder talked about, we're done with the types of shadows now, the Savior's here. Matthew 28 and 1. 28 and 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of Yahweh descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Mm -hmm. His countenance was light, was like lightning. Boom. Here we go. Sheck and I. You know, see, and then the founders already lined this up. So what you got here, he, he, he's lined up the, the day of atonement, the Sheck and I appearing in the heart and mind of the high priest. He's lined up the Sheck and I that, 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 uh, that happened on the, on the uh, uh, day of Pentecost with the Jews in the upper room. And it happens again with the Gentiles down there with Peter. And it's happening here at the resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah. 
He's tied all this together for us. Read on, Seth. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and the angel of Yahweh descended from heaven and, the, and came and rolled back the stone from, upon, from the door and sat upon it. His countenance mm -hmm. was like lightning, and his raiment was white as snow. Mm -hmm. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Right. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Yahshua, which was crucified. He is not here, He's for not he is here. risen. He's risen. As he said. And Come. He, 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 he's never going to die again. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, read, Seth. Come, see the place where Messiah lay. That's good. Okay. Now, I want to go to, give me Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Uh, I want Hebrews 9 and 6. And we're going to read through to the 12th verse. And then I want you to stay in Hebrews and drop down to the 22nd verse. But start at Hebrews 9 and 6. Hebrews 9 and 6. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of So Yahweh. now we got the Apostle Paul rehearsing what, what the priest did back there. Go ahead and read. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit, thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle was yet standing, mm -hmm. was a figure for the time then present in which what, we're off. What's that mean, Paul? The way into heaven. Or, or, or total salvation wasn't made manifest for real while the first tabernacle yet stood. But now when Paul is on the scene down here, it's wide open now because we read in Matthew 27 that the temple was what? Rent in twain. So it, it, you, you see how it's lining up? Read. Ninth verse, which was a figure for the time then present and which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. And he's, which, he's, we, we, I love, I love, I love Hebrews. I just do. And he's telling them, he's telling us that the way into heaven or what made manifest back then. And he said, even the, the service and gifts and sacrifices couldn't make the one that even performed the service perfect. As pertaining to is say as pertaining to the conscious, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what and 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 this is where the founder is really talking about when he says that the preachers still don't understand this, and and we didn't either until we were told and showed that there, there, there's nothing that you can do down here now as far as a, a carnal work to be delivered. Salvation has already come. Read. Which stood only in meat and drink off, I'm sorry, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Mm -hmm. But Messiah being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, mm -hmm. not made with hands, mm -hmm. that is to say, not of this building. Not of this building, so not of the tabernacle back there. It's a, it's a, it's a phenomenal type. Don't misunderstand it. Not in a temple. It's a phenomenal type. But that ain't what he's talking about. He's a he's a high priest in the great and more ta perfect tabernacle. So he ministered in the earth plane. And more importantly, he ministered in the hearts and minds of his sons. Keep going. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the hope into the most holy place, having obtained eternal redemption, redemption for us. Mm hmm. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to Yahweh, purge your conscience from death, from dead works to serve the living Elohim. Elohim? So what Paul is saying is if 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 natural blood back there purified, the, the, uh, if that worked to purify the, the, the physical man then how much more should the blood of Yahshua save a man spiritually? So drop down to the uh, 922. 22nd verse. 
And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And mm -hmm. without shedding of blood is no remission. There's no remission. It so, was there. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves was better sacrifices than these. Mm -hmm. For Messiah. So, go ahead. For Messiah is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of Yahweh for us. Fine, stop right there. So you, you see you see what's happened. So all of this now, see, see that the apostles now, after being quickened with the Holy Spirit, they they understand, they understand the mission of Yahshua the Messiah now. They understand the the functioning of the high priest in the pattern and in the temple they understand that they're one and the same they, <laughs> and, and, and most importantly they understand that all that ministering back there in those physical structures were types and shadows and that Yahshua the messiah is the true high priest atoning for the souls of men in the greater and more ter and per perfect tabernacle and in the consciousness of a man. They are fully versed in this now. This is what the Holy Spirit has done. He did it for them back there. Now we got to sit down here and trust and believe that Yahweh through his son, Yahshua the Messiah can do the self same thing for us. Now I want you to, but now we're going to jump back to the textbook because it's a couple things that I, I uh, that the founders got in here that we we gotta have read. I I want you to go to uh, uh, volume two, page four, and um, we're we're gonna we're gonna wrap up with these things here tonight. Uh, I want you to get volume two, page four, and um, I want you to pick it up in there. The, the paragraph I think it is, or in, in there where it says Yahweh moved from super and corporeal form. And this is in the assignment, the prophetic birth date of Yahshua. Um, Let me see. Um, volume two, page four. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, volume two, page four. Um, it's, it's at the top of the page. Just at the top of the page? Yeah. Okay, grab that. Um, <laughs> from Nazareth of Galilee. Go ahead, Nick. Okay, so it starts on the bottom of page three, that sentence. Um, okay. It says, okay, if one can just appreciate the workings of the divine spirit, which moved Joseph and Mary from one place to another, according to the mm -hmm. prearranged circumstances, then one can discern the manifold wisdom of Yahweh. Just as Yahweh moved from pure spirit to super incorporeal form, Joseph and Mary moved, I'm sorry, Joseph and Mary from Naz yeah, moved from Nazareth of Galilee to Bethlehem of Judea. And as Yahweh moved from super incorporeal form to physical form, then Joseph and Mary moved from Bethlehem of Judea to Egypt. Mm -hmm. this, divine, this divine ordering follows the pattern for it is exemplified by the high priest being in the most holy place where the cloud dwelt on the day of atonement and his de descent from the most holy place to the holy place and then on out into the outer court with him also changing his garments in the holy place. As da, 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 stop. So then now going back to what I said earlier, he can't come out of the holy place dressed in those garments of beauty and glory. So what the founder is doing here, he's tying in the high priest changing his clothes at the altar, putting on the white linen before he comes back out. And he's tying that to Yahweh Elohim, moving from super incorporeal shape and form to a coat of flesh and manifesting in the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah. So then in a type, Yahshua the Messiah walking around in the flesh is likened unto the high priest in the white linen. When he's when the high priest is dressed in the garments of beauty and glory, officiating in the most holy place, now 
that's he, that's Yahweh Elohim in the super incorporeal form. This stuff just blows your mind. He's just lining it up, lining it up, lining it up. Is there anything else there, Nikki? That's the end of that paragraph. Okay, now let's jump to volume three, page 25. And he's and this is the the, the assignment is the reproductive system and the pattern. And the, uh, it starts out with, uh, I want you to grab what it says, since this downward motion uh, um, uh, always pertains to the putting on of the flesh, um, uh, uh, find, find that. Um, and that's on page 25. Uh, got it. You got it? So this is in the page 25. This is the third paragraph sort of the middle of the paragraph. Okay. Since this downward motion always pertains to the putting on of the flesh or coming from pure spirit down to, phys down to physical manifestation as evidenced by the high priest taking off the garments for beauty and glory in the holy place mm -hmm. and putting on his daily attire. Mm -hmm. And as evidenced by Adam and Eve being given coats of skin to cover them. Mm -hmm. And as Joseph had a coat of many colors when he was sold down into Egypt, yeah, we, we had we had we had this all figured out. We had it all figured out. No, you didn't. You 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 didn't know nothing. We didn't know nothing. And he's just walking it walking through this book and tying in all of this stuff to the day of atonement and the priest getting dressed, undressed, putting this on, taking this off because he's got to do this and be here. And then the man and the woman who who knew that the man and the woman being driven out of the garden and then and clothing themselves in 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 <laughs> and wrapping themselves is like an unto the priest coming out of the, the, the most holy place and holy place. Didn't know that. Read. Likewise, we see the testes being invested or covered with six different coverings. Stop as they right there. I, stop right there. We don't want to go no further with that. But I'm, I'm just this this stuff, and, and for me, it, it 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 gives me joy to go back into it and then to, to go back in and find more stuff. This stuff been in the textbook all the time. And to go back in and find more things that Yahweh, these, 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 these jewels, if you will, that he's laid down, that you just keep turning over a new stone and there's another piece to this. And there's, there's, there's another part to the story that just is being uncovered every time we go back and work with this and every time we go back and look with, look at this uh we got about seven or eight minutes left i haven't had read now i need you to stay in volume three and i want you to get that diagram on page 42 i think it is where it shows the um and i think i have that i sent you those notes and they're highlighted in yellow um where you see the uh circle of willis yes Yes, and that that nar that narration that's right under the diagram. Go ahead. Yes, that. Uh, go ahead and start reading at the top there. The diagram on the left or above displays a very unusual phenomenon that is not seen in any other area of the body. This is the arterial circle of Willis, where seven arteries come together to form a circle. This state of affairs come about in the following fashion: the two vertebral arteries located on either side of the spine unite into the basilar artery just as they enter the cranial cavity. The now remember when we showed you on the, the PowerPoint, those two arteries, they come up and then they unite. And, you, and now in the, in the illustration, you can only see one of them. The other one's on the other side of the vertebral column, but they unite at the base of the brain uh, at that basilar artery and become basically become the basilar artery. Read. The basilar artery then unites with the two posterior cerebral arteries and they with the two posterior communicating arteries and these unite with the two middle cerebral arteries which are connected in front by the one anterior communicating artery. Mm -hmm. The three pairs of arteries excluding the basilar plus the one anterior communicating artery, seven in all, comprise the circle of Willis, which distribute blood to the base of the brain. What does this all mean? Let us turn to the functions of the two low priests and the high priests in the tabernacle on the day of atonement. 
Mm-hmm. The two low priests represented by the two vertebral arteries could not go any further than the second veil in the holy place. So you they, see how they stop at the base and unite and become that basal artery so they can't go no further. He's got it laid down. Read. They were not allowed in the most holy place, but the high priest represented by the basal artery went into the most holy place alone and by himself just once a year on the day of atonement and yep. sprinkled go ahead and sprinkle blood of the sacrificial animal toward the mercy seat seven times on three different occasions seven in the purpose and plan of yahweh means perfection or completeness therefore the seven arteries come together in a circle a circle represents completeness to sprinkle or distribute the blood to the base of the brain. Furthermore, these arteries form a stick figure of a man, and with the red blood circulating through them, this figure of a red man located within the gray and white matter of the brain, the cloud, represents Elohim, who was crucified before the foundation of the world. As the prophet Isaiah wrote, who is- Stop right there. Stop right there. So there's a man standing up in your head by and it's, it's a these seven arteries coming together and it's like that high priest standing before the throne of Yahweh it's blood being flickered through those arteries just as blood was flickered toward that mercy seat uh it uh, in, in in the tabernacle pattern um Yahweh is indisputable um and I look at this as his mercy um, being extended to us because he did not have to show us anything. He did not have to reveal himself unto mankind at the end of this age. He did not have to, but he did. And for us that claim to see, know, and understand, it should be our, our joy to, to share these things with others that they might come to a knowledge and understanding as well. Um, to not try to change them, to tamper with them, to mess with them. And if we tell the story right, what you're going to see is that Yahweh is drawing a line through this book and he's connected all of these dots for him. All we got to do is step in his footsteps and follow this thing all the way down. And, and, and the things that we call, we call uh, um, correlations, um, it's just Yahweh manifesting his will in this way through the law and the prophets and through your own physical body and this creation letting you know that everything you see, no touch, sm- smell, hear, and taste is him. And it's talking about him. And it's talking about the salvation of his son, Yahshua, the Messiah, down there when it points to those things. And um, um, we, could, we could go on with this, but I'm going to end right here. But um, I just want to say um, thanks be to Yahweh. Uh, thank all of you for the time and uh, for your attention tonight. And, um, and, and we didn't even get to, and it's not time. And I'm gonna take a couple minutes, do this, I, oh, I lied. Let's go back to the textbook. <laughs> go, to pay, go to volume one, and I promise I'll end with this. Go to the assignment, Peril of the So-Called Jew. And I want you to get it at, cause it, it starts on page 98, but it, it, it reads on through the 104, but I want you to go to page 104. And I want you to get where it says, furthermore, because the Jews non-acceptance, uh, and we'll close with that. Uh, Second paragraph, Nikki. Gotcha. Uh, Page 104. Um, you said the sentence starts with furthermore? Furthermore, yes. 
or what you would call the first paragraph, if the lines, if the, the uh, um, uh, uh, if you're talking about what's carried over from the other page, I'm not talking about that. So I'm calling that the second paragraph, but you may call it the first paragraph. It says, Further, furthermore, because of the Jews' non-acceptance or rejection of Yahshua the Messiah. That's what I want. I got it. It's on okay. page 104. Yeah. Furthermore, yeah, because of the Jews' non-acceptance or rejection of Yahshua the Messiah or his failure and not continuing to offer the sacrifice of blood for the atonement of his sins, as required by the Mosaic law, he is still, even today, in the depths of his sins. Mm -hmm. It is through Keep the going. blood. It is through the blood of the Paschal Lamb, the Passover, and the sacrifices thereafter continued under the Mosaic law that typified or foreshadowed the blood of Yahshua the Messiah which was shed for us that we both Jew and Gentile have received the true atonement. You can't say it any better than that. And if you go back and, and, and look in your textbook, guys, when he says, which uh, uh, the blood of Messiah, which was shed for us, he has us capitalized that we both Jew and Gentile have received. And then it says the true atonement that's capitalized as well. So all of this stuff we've been talking about tonight is talking about the saving of a soul. That's what's being done down here in these schools. That's what's supposed to be being done down here in these schools by the preaching of the gospel. With these few words, I say hallelujah. 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 This concludes this evening's <clears throat> class. Are there any announcements? Yes. 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 On the October 24th, there will not be any physical class down at the Rock Lake building. That Sunday lecture will be done via Zoom. And if you have any questions, you can check with me. Also, for the new people on the line that's listening tonight, if you have any questions, Hang around on the call afterwards and ask your questions then. Thank you. In-person class will be held this Sunday at Rock Lake Community Center from 10.30 to 1.30 p.m. This includes setup and breakdown. Temperature check will be taken at the door. Face masks must be worn at all times. Class donations can be sent via Cash App or mail to the post office box that should be on the screen. It's okay, we'll get it to them later, keep going. We will now have <clears throat> closing comments from the Dean of the State of Florida and the Dean of the Orlando Branch, Dr. Jacqueline Mixon. Good evening, class. Good Can evening. you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. As always, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the lectures and the speakers tonight it, it it's very edifying for them and it's also edifying for the listeners and it just causes us to stay in the scriptures continue doing our research and know that all of this was revealed by the vision that was given to our founder they all praise glory goes to our heavenly father yahweh through his son, Yahshua, let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. We will now close with the doxology taken from the book of Judah, the 24th and the 25th verse. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, to Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belongs glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time 
now and forever. Let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. hallelujah.